Okay, good afternoon. Um, I am Dr. Ashley DeLeon. I am a uh, board certified general surgeon and a fellowship, change, fellowship trained transgender surgeon um, who practices at the Crane Center for Transgender Surgery um, in Austin, Texas. And um, today uh, we are going to go through questions for chest masculinizing surgery. Uh, so mostly this is going to be double incision, top surgery, or um, keyhole um, top surgery. Uh, feel free, um, I have a list of questions that were um, messaged uh, in advance that I will start with and go through. Uh, but if you all have any questions um, specifically that I haven't covered, feel free to uh, send them in and we will uh, try to get to them um, as quickly as possible. So. Uh, let's start with the first question. Do you prefer the double incision surgical approach or keyhole and what is the difference? Um, okay, so for, uh, for, like, for a personal preference, I prefer double incision. Um, and uh, the reason is because double incision top surgery um, gives the surgeon the most um, kind of reconstructive freedom. Um, and most artistic freedom to really create you a nice masculinized chest. Um, so um, in, in addition, um, we've developed um, techniques to mitigate and not use drains during that operation. Um, so uh, for me personally, I, I enjoy doing the double incision uh, top surgery. That being said, um, keyhole certainly has a place. Um, the problem um, that I've run into is uh, there's not a ton of candidates um, to have a successful um, keyhole surgery, um, which I, uh, I assume we'll kind of get to later too with some additional questions um, down the line. Um, but the main difference, um, double incision top surgery, um, you know, kind of the downside is that you're going to have um, those inframammary scars that you've probably seen in, um, you know, photographs. Um, of other patients before um, where you have kind of the scars under on the bottom border of your pec muscle um, on both sides. Um, that and then the fact that the nipple has to be grafted on, which means it's completely removed from your body at the beginning of the operation. Um, and then it's put on in a new spot um, after the operation and we're relying on, um, you know, we're gonna reshape it, resize it and thin it so that we can apply it to your body in a separate area as a graft. Um, but, um, you know, in doing that, of course, you know, there's a risk of losing that nipple graft. Um, so those are kind of downsides of double incision. Um, but overall, um, you know, patients do really well. And it's, and it's a great operation, which is why it's my personal favorite. Um, with keyhole, um, we're not doing much nipple work at all, um, if any. Um, we don't change the shape, size, or location of the nipple or areola complex. Um, significantly during a keyhole operation. Um, so you don't have to worry about the nipple grafts, which is one of the advantages. Um, the other advantage of a keyhole is the surgical scars or the incisions. And this is the main reason people will choose um, a keyhole if they are in fact a candidate for a keyhole um, is because the scar is just a few centimeters and it is located right, it's a periareolar incision, which means um, it is right along that bottom side of your areola, right where the skin and areola border meet. Um, and it's just that tiny little incision that we're using a lighted retractor to go in and scoop out all the mammary tissue um, and remove it in that fashion. Um, and so it's no surgery is scarless. There's no such thing as a scarless surgery, but um, this is as close to a scarless surgery for chest masculinizing surgery as you can get. Um, Cause as you can imagine that tiny little scar right on that border is fairly well hidden um, after the operation. So those are the benefits, the downsides of a keyhole um, when compared to double incision are that um, again, you're not changing um, the size, shape or location much of the nipple and areola. Um, so, um, you need to keep that in mind um, for um, making sure that you're going to have a successful outcome and be a good candidate for a keyhole. Um, and then in addition, because we're working through a tiny incision with a lighted retractor, we don't have the ability um, to use our technique to, to eliminate drains from the operation. Um, and so for a keyhole, unfortunately, we still do have to have um, drains in place um, after surgery. And then um, in addition to that, um, if you have any excess 
skin or soft tissue or if you have um, you know too much mammary tissue all those things coupled with your nipple size shape and placement um, can um, make for a pretty bad result if you do a keyhole in the wrong patient um, and so you know patients need to be very carefully selected um, to have a um, keyhole um, you know chest masculinizing surgery um, in order to ensure a good surgical outcome um, so those are kind of like the advantages and disadvantages if you're talking about double incision versus keyhole um, and then yeah overall I would say um, some of the literature says about 80% of all patients um, do double incision I would say um, anecdotally in my experience that's more like probably 90% of patients um, or maybe 95 um, are all double incision um, versus keyhole um, just because um, you know body habitus um, size of the you know your chest size um, as well as your nipple placement all that comes into play and unfortunately I have seen um, patients come from other practices um, who um, insisted on a keyhole um, surgeon did it for them they were not a candidate and it is it is a pretty bad result um, with um, you know excess skin hanging over the, the um, you know scar line and everything else so um, so yeah that would I guess that would be my my take on double incision um, versus keyhole uh, next question is why do you move the nipples during surgery? Uh, so for this is obviously I guess referring to double incision um, top surgery. So the reason we move the nipples um, is we uh, the nipple and areola um, are typically for most patients who aren't a candidate for a keyhole. Um, these patients are going to have um, their nipple and areola typically uh, hanging uh, a little bit lower because they have some ptosis, um, which means drooping um, of their chest um, or their mammary tissue. Um, and um, typically they're also going to be larger and the areola is going to be larger than what a masculine uh, nipple and areola complex would look like. And they're going to be lower and more, um, you know, kind of within that milk line. Um, versus a masculine chest where you're going to have smaller nipple areolar complex and it's typically going to be a little bit higher and a little bit further out um, than for a cis female and so um, the reason we move the nipples number one is to achieve that um, masculinized chest um, and secondly because you can't remove um, the entire you know enlarged areola um, as well as um, all the excess skin um, and soft tissue that's associated with your chest, um, we're not able to take that out unless we take the nipples off. Um, and so um, that's why at the very beginning of double incision chest surgery, the first maneuver after you know everything's ready to go um, is we actually take your nipples completely off your body, we reshape them, we re resize them, and then we thin them and we set them aside and then put them back on in a different position um, later in the operation. Once everything, you have a nice flat chest, everything's closed up, then we actually sit you up in the operating room while you're still asleep under general anesthesia and decide where to place the new uh, nipple grafts um, so that they're in a nice masculinized position they're in a masculinized size and they are um, as symmetric as you know humanly possible which is why we sit you up in the operating room to look so um, <clears throat> I and someone just asked if I have a small chest what would be best for me um, well th that depends um, on also your nipple placement shape size um, and when you say small chest, um, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. If you are a candidate for a keyhole, meaning um, you are happy with the size, shape, and placement of your nipples as they are now, and you don't have any ptosis or drooping of the breast with excess skin that needs to be removed during the operation, um, and that's what you mean by small chest, um, then in that case, I would definitely do a keyhole um, just for the fact that um, it's again it's mostly a as scarless of an operation as you can have um, with top surgery um, and it's you know very unnoticeable um, scars at the end of the day um, so for example if I were going to have um, chest masculinizing surgery um, if I was a candidate for keyhole I would get keyhole um, however if um, again 
there's so many factors that come into play of whether a keyhole is going to give you the aesthetic outcome that you want, um, which is why most patients end up with double incision. But um, if your chest is small enough and you don't have excess skin and your nipples and areola are in a good position, um, then we can get you a fantastic result with a keyhole. And so in that case, I would still go for the keyhole and just suffer through the drains um, you know, for a week um, so that I could minimize my scars. Um, but that's but that's just me um, and then um, you know I, I'm happy to you know I can see patients in person to determine whether they're um, that's obviously the easiest way uh, to determine whether you're a candidate for a keyhole or would be better off with a double incision however um, if um, you know we're doing a, a consultation by phone or whatever else then you can also send in pictures and I will tell you um, it is very very common for me to do phone consultations since our patients come from all over the world um, and when I'm doing a phone consultation, if you have any inkling in your mind that you may be a candidate for a keyhole, then please, before you do a consult, a phone consultation with a surgeon, send their office pictures of your chest. I know that's miserable, um, but it was really, really helpful. Um, if you do a photo straight on, and then you do a photo completely lateral from this side, and then completely lateral from this side, that's gonna help your surgeon decide um, to see how much tissue you have, how much skin you have, what your nipples look like, where they're located, and that's gonna help them be able to tell you um, on the phone whether they think you would um, have a good result if you went forward or moved forward with a um, keyhole operation. Uh, okay, another question just came up. How long is the typical recovery time? Um, so for um, chest masculinizing surgery in general, um, typically four weeks is the answer for almost everything. Um, as far as activity, as far as hygiene, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, Let's just take double incision um, for uh, four weeks. The activity restrictions, um, we don't want you doing anything strenuous and no heavy lifting, so nothing over 10 pounds for four weeks after double incision top surgery. And then in addition, we don't want you reaching up over your head. Um, that does not mean that you have to come in like everybody always comes in, which I understand. Your chest feels tight, it feels very tight once it's all flat, and so it's a natural instinct to wanna hunch your shoulders over and take your elbows and attach them to your hips like a raptor. Um, I have patients come in that say they've been sleeping in the recliner and not sleeping in their bed like normal because they're too afraid to lay flat. If I can't build you a chest that's not gonna fall apart with you laying flat on a bed, then that's my problem, not yours. Um, so I, I do not do any of those restrictions. You can lay flat on a bed. You do not need to sleep in a recliner. You can stand up straight. Please stand up straight. Um, you'll be fine. Um, and you can also put your arms out to here, okay? You can make a T with your body or a 90 degree angle um, with your arm in your body, arms parallel to the floor. That's fine. You don't have to come in like this. This is fine. I just don't want you doing this. And the only reason I don't want you doing that is because you have a fresh incision, especially with double incision where you have the larger um, incisions and scars to worry about. Um, anytime you have um, a fresh incision, um, when you're in kind of healing mode, when you put tension or stress on that incision, um, that sensation of it wanting to kind of pull apart, um, anytime you do that, what it does is it makes you scar wider. Um, and the whole, you know, you know, thing about double incision is, you know, the scars, right? We want to minimize the scars and give you a good cosmetic result. And so if you're putting too much stress on them and making yourself scar wider, it's just kind of counterproductive. Um, so that's why for four weeks, we have no lifting over 10 pounds and no doing this. Everything else is on the table and is okay. Um, and then in addition, um, after that point, um, you're no doubt gonna have a little bit of, um, you know, decrease in your, you know, strength as well as range of motion because you've been, you know, kind of following those parameters for four weeks. Um, so once those four weeks are up, you're welcome to get back in the gym, start lifting. I don't care if you bench press, um, do whatever you want to do. I just always recommend that you start slow and remember you're gonna have to kind of take a back step and work back up to where you were prior to surgery because you've taken four weeks off. Um, and that's really important so that you don't injure yourself um, when you're getting back to your normal kind of vigorous activity, lifting, and so forth and so on. Um, so, and then in addition, um, when you're talking about recovery time, um, that's activity wise. Um, at four weeks also, um, you're able to um, start swimming again or getting in the bath or the pool. Um, after the first post-op visit, I allow you to start showering, but because of the nipple grafts, 
um, and uh, take a while to heal in. Um, we don't want you to submerge your chest in standing water of any kind for four weeks um, to make sure that we're preventing freshwater infections, which can be pretty severe. Um, and so um, four weeks is also the answer for that. Um, and also at four weeks, usually the nipple grafts have, you know, completely pinked back up, normal color, you know, it looks more like a sc little scar around the nipple instead of, um, you know, a fresh incision. There's no little open areas. And so usually at that point in time, at four weeks, you can stop all your um, care to the nipple alveolar complex, um, which is usually just bacitrace and ointment and big band-aids, but you don't have to worry about that anymore after four weeks and you can start swimming and you can get back to your usual activity. So again, almost everything with double incision is a four weeks. Uh, keyhole, very similar, but for keyhole, because the scars are a little bit different, um, it's more, and you're not worried about nipple grafts with a keyhole. Um, and so for keyhole, some of those requirements bump up to two weeks instead of four weeks. Um, so a little bit quicker recovery sometimes with a keyhole, depending on how um, people are healing. Um, okay, another new question, what type of surgery is best for a very large chest, a J cup. Okay, um, double incision. That was easy. Um, so um, you and 99% of the population. Um, so anytime you have a large uh, chest, um, I have done top surgeries um, on very large chested patients. I've done top surgeries on patients with a BMI of 49. Um, you know, it's obviously not ideal. Um, the larger your body habitus is, um, and the more severe, um, you know, depending on if it's, if you're just talking about chest um, and the rest of your body, you know, you're not overweight, but you just have a very large chest, um, then that's, that's, you know, that's a no brainer. And that's actually doesn't really add um, any uh, more difficulty or complexity to a double incision. Um, and you'll have a great surgical result. Now, if you have a, um, you know, a J cup, a larger chest, but you also have a larger body habitus or BMI, um, just things to keep in mind, um, you know, any type of um, obesity is gonna increase um, risks for wound healing complications, uh, post-op complications, um, infections, uh, post-op pneumonia, you know, blood clots, all those kinds of things um, are increased the larger your body habitus gets. So just keep that in mind with the recovery process. Um, and then in addition, anything more than a 40 pound swing in your weight, whether you're gaining 40 pounds or losing 40 pounds, um, anything, you know, anything within that 80 pound swing um, is usually not gonna change the cosmetic nature um, of the surgery. However, if it's more than that, then it can. Um, I've had a patient lose 70 pounds after top surgery and ended up having excess skin then hanging over the um, inframammary scars because there was such significant weight loss after. We did a quick revision, everything looks fine now, no big deal, but just things to keep in mind um, if you are, um, you know, have a larger body habitus, um, it's, you know, whatever your goal weight is, um, it's helpful if you can, you know, try to get to that goal weight prior to surgery um, so that it doesn't alter the cosmetic outcome if you're gonna continue to lose weight and then also so that it gives you um, a better opportunity for good surgical outcomes. Um, by reducing your body habitus. But again, if you have, if you're not overweight and you just have a large chest, and, and, and whether you are, and even if you are overweight with a large chest, both of those I would definitely say double incision. Um, and I have done both many, many times. Um, and they have a great, you know, cosmetic result and surgical result typically, um, you know, regardless. But definitely double incision for, for that situation. Okay. Um, what are dog ears and how can I prevent getting them or fix them? Dog ears um, is a term thrown around a lot. Um, do uh, technically a dog ear is where you are closing an incision and the, it's closed in such a fashion that the skin is puckering out at the end of the incision. So at an, an edge of an incision, everything kind of puckers because of the way it was closed. That's a, that's a true dog ear. Um, dog ears thrown around and used a lot um, for any type of, um, you know, pooch or excess, you know, skin or soft tissue under the arm um, after top surgery. Um, very common, um, very common question. Um, so um, again, this all kind of goes back to, um, you know, body habitus. If you're talking about um, just the excess rolls that some patients can have, um, depending on their body habitus under the axilla or under the arm. Um, if you're talking about a true dog ear, um, so just mostly having to do with the closure um, and mostly skin, 
um, then that's um, easily fixed, usually in the office um, under, um, you know, uh, local um, anesthesia. Um, it takes just a few minutes to just to kind of excise or remove that little extra piece of skin or soft tissue um, that's kind of giving you that pooch when your arm is down. Um, we usually wait until about nine months to a year from your initial operation before we entertain um, doing any dog ear revisions and that is because um, it takes about nine months to a year for the final scar maturation to occur and for collagen to turn over the wound bed um, to give you that final scar contracture and that sculpting effect. Um, and so nine times out of ten, um, you know, we have a patient with a, a little tiny, you know, swell or pooch, you know, kind of right here on the end at, you know, three months. Well, by nine months to a year, oftentimes the body has had scar contracture occur and everything's kind of, you know, healed itself and fixed itself. Um, if that's not the case and it's persistent, then yeah, a true dog ear, easy fix, quick and easy. We can do it here in the office. It's not a problem um, under local anesthesia. Um, if you're talking about um, excess skin and soft tissue in the form of, you know, more like a roll, um, you know, under the arm based on, you know, body habitus and weight, um, then that's kind of a different beast. Um, and I will tell you this, um, my main goal um, and, you know, most of the time y'all's main goal um, for all of us is to give you a natural looking chest. Um, so if you have a larger body habitus and you have, um, you know, some excess skin, soft tissue and things like that kind of all the way down on, you know, the sides and in the front, um, then you don't want to chase it too much because if you, if you really kind of carve out and take out all that tissue um, on both sides here, then what happens is um, it really looks concave um, when everything heals because then it comes in and then everything down is still larger. Um, and so it's important to kind of avoid that too because it's just not a natural appearance. Um, and so typically for my patients that have larger BMIs or larger body habitus, number one, I leave a little bit more tissue here um, so that it doesn't look sunken in and concave so that you have a nice contour. And then I also, I will take out as much as I feel, um, will look aesthetically pleasing or look natural over here on the sides. Um, but that does not mean it's going to be all the way down to the chest wall because I don't think that looks natural when you look at somebody and look at their body habitus. Um, so, um, if, that and then the other piece of that is that you do not want to chase things too much to where you're creating a scar that's going all the way around the back because again that doesn't look natural that draws people's eyes and people's attention to that scar as it wraps around your back um, and so I will take as much as um, is you know as possible that you know looks natural and aesthetically pleasing and typically kind of curve the incision up towards the armpit or towards the axilla um, to help kind of hide that scar and not have it wrap around um, and look too unnatural. Um, in the, and after everything's healed and all said and done, similar to a true dog ear, if there's any you know problems, concerns, things didn't heal right, um, you feel like there's still too much tissue there, it's too prominent, maybe you lost some weight and now you want some more tissue taken out from there, whatever it may be, um, that's all, um, you know, easy um, revisions, you know, that we can do either in the operating room or the office, depending on how much tissue we're talking about. Um, and that we, um, that's probably the most common revision um, that we do, um, you know, at the Crane Center. Um, but that being said, most of our revisions are about, you know, uh, for top surgery are around probably five, five percent of patients. Um, so most patients have surgery and then don't need anything further. Um, but if we are doing revisions, um, for top surgery, um, probably five ten percent. Um, then that is um, that is a, a common one to do some more work under the under the arm. Um, okay, how do you choose what shape to make the scars? This is a very very common question. I get it all the time. Um, so for keyhole, um, the uh, the scar is determined by your areola, right? It's a periola inc periolar incision. Um, so it's gonna be right on the underside of your areola where it meets the skin edge. Done, that's it, okay? That's keyhole. Um, for double incision, um, whereas when I get this question a lot, um, for the what, how we try to plan the incision, the goal for us is to have a very gentle curve. Um, if you look at your body, you will not find a straight line anywhere on your body. The body is made up of gentle curves, the entire thing. There are no straight lines. Um, and so because of that, we try to make our uh, incisions and the scars 
um, with a very gentle, slight curve to them so that they look natural and um, are not as obvious to the human eye um, when they're staring at your chest. Um, that being said, we also don't want them too curvy. Um, if they're too swoopy or too curvy, then they start to look feminine, um, which is obviously counterproductive. Um, so it should be um, just a very gentle curve. Um, we don't want them completely straight, again, because there's nothing really straight on the body. Um, and then kind of going back to when we were talking about extra work uh, in the axilla, you also don't want them to, you know, wrap around the back. Again, that's where I talked about I would rather curve them up towards the arm um, so that they're more hidden and less noticeable. And then um, placement wise, oh, and also in the middle, um, four to five centimeters space across your sternum in the center. I don't want them to touch. Um, I've, you know, there's um, in the center at all, because um, again, that doesn't look you know, very natural. Um, and then placement wise, um, I try to place them right on that lower border of your pec major muscle. Um, so that especially if you were to um, postoperatively were to develop your pec muscles, then that scar would be hidden even more um, as the pec muscles develop because it's on the underside of those pec muscles in a very slight curve and, you know, two separate incisions and not wrapping around your back. So that is how we plan our incisions, and that's kind of why we plan our incisions that way to kind of give you the most natural and non-noticeable, uh, you know, a, a noticeable appearance of the scars. Um, that being said, um, this is of course uh, an ask me anything for chest masculinizing surgery specifically, um, but just a, a note: I do have a lot of non-binary gender fluid um, patients as well, and for those patients, um, sometimes we do alter. Um, the incision planning and scar placement and things like that purposefully um, because they do not want a masculine chest or a feminine chest um, and so it gets you know more individualized and you know we do some different things depending on what the patient's goals are um, of surgery but for double incision chest masculinizing surgery that's how we plan our incisions and that's the goal and that's why okay um I have another new question here um when do you when do you what recommend when you recommend implementing post-op massage to increase shoulder range of motion and reduce scar and tissue adhesions um can't get her answer right now it's different gotcha okay so um I uh, tell my patients uh, at four weeks, okay, so typically you're going to have, um, for your inframammary incisions, all the suture is going to be under the skin and dissolve over time, so there's no sutures to remove, and you're going to have these long pieces of tape called steri strips over them as dressings. Now, usually those steri strips are going to start coming off around two to three weeks um, after surgery, um, and once that happens, you're going to pull them off, leave them alone. At that point, your scar is going to look, um, you know, usually red, raised, you know, lumpy, bumpy, maybe asymmetric, you know, I mean, they're not the prettiest thing initially out of the gate, right? Um, because you haven't had a chance for scar maturation and healing to occur yet. Um, but as soon as you hit that four week mark, um, you know, again, four weeks, it's kind of the answer for a lot of the stuff with um, double incision top surgery. Um, but once you've done that, like all the, 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 the top layer of skin is very, very well healed and sealed um, so that you're not gonna um, be getting anything, um, you know, into the incision, in other words, um, or introduce infection or anything. Um, plus, by four weeks, you're usually more comfortable, um, you know, from a you know pain or you know discomfort standpoint um, to massage your scars. Um, so I tell my patients at four weeks, get to it. Um, we use 100% uh, silicone based gels is what I really recommend um, to put on the uh, scars to help with scar care and I would do it starting at four weeks up until you're at least a year out from surgery um, because again your final scar maturation that whole process is still going on for that entire at least year out from surgery so you have that long to work with your incisions um, and so I recommend a few things number one massage 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 um, regardless of any um, actual formal scar cares like silicone products and things like that, um, massage the manual stimulation of massaging your scar is actually going to help stimulate your body to turn collagen over in the wound bed and help that scar maturation occur. Um, so the more you massage it, the better. Um, 
And I don't care if you do it in the shower or with soap or, um, you know, lotion, Vaseline, whatever. The more you think about it and can look down and just massage those scars in the surgical site for, you know, contour irregularities and stuff, um, the better off you're going to be. Um, and then if you add on a silicone base, uh, you know, if you want to add on a scar care, you know, product, then I always recommend a, um, a silicone gel. Um, the strips, the silicone strips, um, I think work okay too. Um, they're not my personal favorite just because um, that manual stimulation is really important when you're um, talking about, you know, um, scar care. And if you have strips, then patients just pop the strip on and then there's no massaging. Whereas um, if you have a silicone gel, which still forms an occlusive barrier and basically functions the same way as a strip, um, but then you're also actually forcing yourself to put it on your scar, and by doing that, you're massaging your scar. Um, so I like the silicone gels, and then the last piece of that is that you need to keep it out of the sun. If you're gonna be in the sun, you need to wear a shirt, or if you're gonna be shirtless, you need to put sunscreen over those scars, because the scars, especially during the first year of healing, are going to pick up the UV rays more so than the surrounding skin that hasn't had an incision placed on it and doesn't have a scar on it. And by doing that, the scar gets hyperpigmented, which means it gets darker than the surrounding skin, which makes it more noticeable. So if you want your scars, you know, to really be light and not noticeable, to be really thin, flat, massage them, use silicone gel products, keep them out of the sun, start it at four weeks and continue it for at least a year and you'll probably have a good result. Uh, okay, um, how long is the surgery? Takes me about an hour and a half. Double incision top surgery is about an hour and a half um, for um, maybe two hours. You know, if, if it's a larger body habitus, if I'm doing extra work under the axilla, um, if you couple that with also some extra nipple work, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, patients' nipples, um, the nipple itself, not the areola, but the nipple um, can be, you know, kind of have like a gumdrop appearance um, where it has a lot of projection, it sticks out a lot and it's pretty, pretty wide. Um, and when we're making, um, you know, a nice masculine chest, we need to also do some extra stuff um, to have that work out well with the areola so they have a good um, masculine nipple um, uh, areolar complex. Um, and so if I'm doing a bunch of extra stuff like that along with the double incision, then sometimes it can be a little bit over two hours. Um, but yeah, more like hour and a half, two hours for double incision. For keyhole is a little bit different. Keyhole takes longer um, just because of the nature of the operation. Um, you know, you're working through a tiny hole with a lighted tractor, putting in drains, you know, that kind of a thing. And so it takes longer. Um, that typically takes somewhere between two to four hours, um, just kind of depending, you know, patient to patient. Okay, next question. Will I be in a lot of pain after surgery? Um, for double incision, short answer, no. Um, it's actually surprising to me um, how well um, our patients do after top surgery. It is a uh, pretty maximally invasive, you know, big surgery. Um, but uh, what we found is that um, eliminating the use of drains in our double incision, um, you know, chest masculinizing procedures um, has really um, taken down um, the pain that patients are experiencing um, after surgery by not having that drain sit on the chest wall. Um, and so because of that, the biggest complaint I get with my patients is that they have a feeling of chest tightness, um, which makes sense, right? We're removing a bunch of tissue and bringing everything taut and, and, and suturing it together to give you a nice flat chest. Um, you know, right on top of your pec muscle. And so because of that, um, you know, it makes you feel like an elephant's kind of sitting on your chest. Everything feels very, very tight, which is why, again, people come in like this. Um, it's kind of a natural, um, you know, reaction um, to that sensation. Um, and so that kind of feeling of tightness is the main complaint I get after top surgery as far as pain or discomfort is concerned. Um, as far as, um, you know, sharp pain um, or, um, you know, severe pains, um, not not so much with double incision of course you know pain's a very subjective thing everybody experiences it differently um but for the most part most of my patients do great i honestly most of my patients only take pain pills for a couple days um and then switch over to things like you know ibuprofen and other anti-inflammatories um and you know maybe st still keep taking muscle relaxers you know to help with their pec muscle spasming and things like that but um for as far as like the opiate pain medication like the narcotic pain medications most of my patients don't need a whole lot um after double incision top surgery 
um, keyhole, um, similar with the exception of, um, you know, you have those drains sitting on the chest wall. Um, so my patients with keyholes until they come see me to have the drains removed for that first, you know, like four to seven days after surgery, um, do tend to complain of a little bit more, um, you know, kind of pain and discomfort along the chest wall. And again, I think that's because of the drain kind of sitting in that pocket, you know, and sitting on your pec muscle, kind of irritating things. Um, and then as soon as the drains come out at the post-op visit, you know, then again, most patients, you know, have pretty minimal, um, you know, pain and discomfort after, after the surgery. What dressings will I go home with um, for whether you're doing uh, double incision or keyhole? Um, when you wake up, you're going to have a surgical binder in place. Um, it's basically an abdominal binder that we also use for chest stuff. It's a big white surgical binder with Velcro. Um, um, under that, you're going to have a bunch of fluffy gauze and things like that to help kind of in the binder kind of tight to give compression, um, you know, to the to the flaps to help prevent fluid accumulation, swelling, bleeding, you know, all that kind of stuff, um, and help everything kind of scar down to the chest wall. Um, then um, for keyholes, you also, of course, have a drain on each side attached to that. For double incision, um, underneath all the fluffy stuff, then you're also going to have um, uh, bolster dressings um, if you're doing nipple reconstruction. Um, I have some patients do double incision without nipples, but if you have doing nipple reconstruction, then yes, you're going to also have um, bolster dressings sutured on underneath, which are, um, you know, some of my patients call nipple pillows or nipple muffins. I think they look like little dumplings, um, but whatever you want to call it, that's you know also going to be um, in place after surgery. Um, again, for your incisions, um, in other words, like either the, the inframammary incisions for double incision or the periareolar incisions for keyhole, both of those are going to have sutures under the skin that dissolve over time and covered with steri strips. For um, the nipple grafts in double incision, you're going to have external sutures that have to be removed at the post-op visit. Um, and the bolster dressings, um, and then yeah, that's it for that's it for dressings. Um, while I have surgical drains, I think we already covered that, right? You're not gonna have drains for double incision. We don't ever use drains for double incision, um, and um, you will definitely have drains for keyhole. So um, that's you know pretty black and white as far as whether you're gonna have drains or not. Um, at least you know the way we practice here at the Crane Center. Um, I do also. Um, get questions however um, about um, why we are able to not use drains with double incision um, and so um, that's a very common question and um, the reason it, it's 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 kind of a bit more of a complex answer um, but basically the um, you know drains number one um, drains for any type of uh, you know chest surgery or mastectomy um, is um, you know, there to help with fluid accumulation, right? So you can have serous fluid, which is that clear fluid that's kind of yellow tinged um, that your body is gonna produce anytime we make an incision anywhere on your body. Um, the body likes to fill empty spaces with fluid. That's what it does. Um, and so that's serous fluid. And so if that accumulates um, at the surgical site or underneath your flap, um, then that creates what's called a seroma, okay? And so if you have drains in, the theory is that you're gonna help drain that seroma fluid. Um, the other reason is for, you know, bleeding and oozing. Um, so to help with that, you can, you know, put a drain in and, you know, oftentimes the output initially will be fairly bloody and then get more serious as time goes on when you do have a drain in place. Um, what we've figured out over the years, and since I used to do um, a lot of breast surgery for um, cancer patients before, um, you know, doing transgender surgeries, um, it, uh, you know, what I found is that, you know, typically after about two weeks, most surgeons want that um, drain out. Everybody asks about this all the time. Um, so you want that drain out, right? And um, because you don't want bacteria um, to crawl up the drain and infect the surgical site. So most surgeons are going to take it out at two weeks. Um, that being said, um, what we found is that even if it's draining serous fluid at two weeks and you pull it, the body's still going to produce serous fluid after. Kind of delays the inevitable. It may decrease it some, but ultimately you're still going to get serous fluid accumulation. Um, and then when it comes to bleeding, if you're having bleeding that's going to be a problem that we need to go back to the operating room for and fix, um, then the thing is, is drains clot off almost immediately. Um, and then 
and then the the blood you know accumulates under the flap anyways and you're in the operating room regardless of having drains in if you have a bleeding problem if you have surgical bleeding you have surgical bleeding drains not going to fix it um and then the other piece of it is that we found that again patients with a drain sitting on their chest wall have a lot more pain and discomfort um, not to mention you have to empty the drain record it bring me a drain log all those kinds of things and so patients just do better in general without having drains in place and so what we did is we just developed a technique um, of in basically internal progression uh, you know uh, tension sutures or um, kind of like quilting um, to close down that space with double incision top surgery and by closing down that space surgically um, then we're able to eliminate the need for having drains in place and then keep in mind you'll have a bind drawn compression um, and things like that for the first week as well which all helps prevent you know fluid accumulation and bleeding um, and so most patients do um, just fine without drains and so we have eliminated them completely um, from our double incision top surgeries all right can you go through the belly button no okay what affects your eligibility um, for you can go through the belly uh, let me little uh, time out all right there is something called a, a tuba which is a um, trans umbilical breast augmentation you can go through the belly button um, for breast augmentation uh, for trans women or for cis women um, but for chest masculinizing surgery to go through the belly button um, no I have not seen that done um, what affects your eligibility for top surgery um, um, I am not okay so your eligibility for top surgery um, you know obviously you need to have um, you know a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and you have to um, be, uh, you know, have a letter from a mental health provider in support of the transition, in support of the surgery, um, living as a man for over a year. If you're non-binary, gender fluid, a um, little bit different, but still obviously living as a non-binary, gender fluid individual for over a year, diagnosis of gender dysphoria, and still a letter from a mental health provider in support of the surgery transition. Um, that's really the big um, eligibility requirements for top surgery. Um, you know, here, um, if you're referring to medical um, issues and um, altering your eligibility for top surgery, um, you know, obesity, you know, it doesn't help, um, you know, but we um, certainly work with everybody individually. Um, we prefer your BMI to be under 35 um, prior to surgery. Um, that being said, um, you know, I have patients that have tried weight loss programs um, you know over and over and over again and you know therapist says it just worsens the dysphoria and it's not gonna happen um, I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna let a patient live in misery and not being able to have surgery because um, it's kind of a catch-22 um, so it's not obesity is not a hard and fast um, you know eligibility you know or something that ruins your eligibility um, but it's something that needs to be individualized and discussed with your surgeon and figured out so we make sure what we're doing is safe and that you you have a good um, cosmetic result um, you know other than that you know I mean if you have some very severe cardiovascular problems um, to where it's not safe to put you under anesthesia um, you know things like that can alter your eligibility um, but I guess I'm, I'm not 100% sure what you're referring to um, in regards to eligibility if um, uh, so if you want to direct message me um, you know later I can actually come back and and uh, give you some more information in regards to that as well um, okay so um, compression binders well I have to wear compression binders after surgery you'll wear a surgical binder for four to seven days after surgery until you come back and see me for the post-op visit and then you don't have to wear it any further after that um, for keyhole um, when you come back a week after surgery to remove the drains um, we take the binder off but at that point for a keyhole since we um, you know can't do tacking sutures um, I do sometimes recommend you wash your binder take it home and wear it in between showers just for another week just to kind of help compression and help prevent fluid accumulation can I shower after surgery no um, you can shower four to seven days after surgery after the binder comes off after the post-op visit um, then you are able to start showering um, no baths pools hot tubs lakes rivers for four weeks after double incision two to four weeks after keyhole um, but showering is fine after your post-op visit when the binder comes off um, in the meantime sponge bath wash your hair in the sink um, what limitations do I have we talked about that um, no reaching overhead no lifting over 10 pounds uh, how can I minimize the chances of having a scar after surgery? 
Well, keyhole, that's already implied, right? I mean, that's minimal scars for double incision. We already talked about that as well for scar care. Massage, keep out of the sun, use silicone-based scar gels. I'll make sure your scars aren't under tension, which is another component from a technical standpoint. Um, and uh, usually people do really well. Um, if I get a bad scar, can you fix it? Of course, um, we do scar revisions all the time. Um, is there any long-term follow-up needed after surgery? Um, so I typically tell my patients to check in at three, six, and 12 months. Um, if they are from out of town, out of state, or out of country, um, I don't make them spend you know the money to fly all the way back here, but um, at least if they can check in with photographs um, through our encrypted and HIPAA protected email, um, then um, they can send in photos and, and check in via email or a phone um, and to let me know how they're doing and so I can look and make sure the scars are maturing right, they don't have any contour irregularities, the nipple grafts took well, um, you know those kinds of things and that they're healing well overall since we don't really have final results until about a year. Um, does insurance cover top surgery in general? 90% of our patients are covered by insurance um, in general, but the main people that I run into problems with are um, patients that are minors. So anybody under the year, under 18 years of age, insurance is not going to cover your top surgery. Um, we have operated on patients and done chest mask and surgery for 13 and up. Um, but if you are under 18 in general, your insurance co insurance is not going to cover it. Um, it'll be um, cash pay. Otherwise, if you're over 18 and you have private insurance, most of the time we are able to get it covered, um, even if we have to do a lot of appeal processes and peer-to-peer -peer reviews. Um, if not, it says what is the cost. Um, we can uh, do a consultation. We can give you an estimate for cash prices um, if you either don't have private insurance or if you have an exclusion policy that we're fighting and not having success with. Um, can I get other procedures done at the same time as my top surgery? Um, yes, um, sometimes we do uh, metoideoplasty at the same time as top surgery. Um, sometimes we do man sculpting or you know liposuction at the same time as top surgery. Um, if you're having, for example, an ALT phalloplasty is what you're planning for the future, we can you know combine the vaginectomy and doing a delayed flap if you know that's whole other conversation. Um, but I guess the short answer um, is yes, we can combine other things with top surgery since the, the procedure itself usually only takes about an you know, hour and a half, two hours. Um, no phalloplasty combined with it though, just FYI. That's a procedure all by itself. Um, but we can do pieces of it or metoideoplasty or other stuff. Um, can I get other procedures? Oh, I just did that. Okay. What happens if one of my nipple grafts doesn't take um, if your nipple graft doesn't take, um, y you know, it's off completely off the body and put back on in a new spot. We're expecting your blood supply to grow into it and heal it. Um, if it doesn't take, once a nipple's gone, it's gone. Um, at that point, um, you're looking at medical tattoo artists um, who do a lot of nipple and breast reconstruction stuff for cancer patients who are pretty phenomenal. Um, but they can do a medical tattoo artists to give you good symmetry from the other side. And if you want to have 3D projection, meaning when you look down, um, you can see the, uh, you know, a small projection of the nipple itself like you do on the other side where the graft took, um, then we can actually lift the tattooed um, skin and put a little piece of uh, silicone carved off a silicone block under it to give you that 3D projection as well to help. Um, but fortunately, um, losing a nipple graft is um, less than 1% in this country. It's never happened to me before, but it can. Um, and so that's how we would handle it. Um, testosterone. Um, do you recommend testosterone and do I need to stop it before surgery? Um, testosterone is completely up to you. Um, some patients are on it, some patients aren't. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but you are allowed to continue your testosterone throughout the entire surgical process. No problem. Um, age requirements, we don't have an age requirement. Again, I mentioned we do 13 and up. At least that's what we've done thus far. Um, but it does become an insurance issue. Um, we talked about healing process. Um, when can I start to work on my chest and how can I prepare my pecs for top surgery? Um, so, um, you know, pec development, I get this question a lot as well. Um, you can, um, oh, did I answer this one? I did, how to wear the binder after surgery, okay. Um, so four to seven days for the binder. Um, then for pec development, um, it doesn't change what I'm gonna do in the operating room. It doesn't make my job any um, easier or harder, um, depending on how developed your pec major muscle is. Um, that being said, what I have found is that my patients who do a lot of pec major development by you know 
um, you know, a lot of chest work beforehand, um, typically they're going to have an aesthetic result that they're happier with right out of the gate from surgery um, versus, um, you know, trying to do all that work after surgery. Um, and the reason is because if you already have a developed pec muscle when you come in for surgery, then when I take all the excess skin and soft tissue and mammary tissue off so that you can see that development and all the hard work that you put in, um, then that's going to be more visible and it's going to be visible, you know, fairly immediately right after surgery. Um, in addition, it's going to actually help the scar or the incision um, kind of hide under that, um, you know, developed pec muscle um, along that lower border where we want it. Um, so most patients um, who do put in the work prior um, are pretty happy, um, you know, right out of the gate, but it doesn't change anything from a technical standpoint. So I leave it up to you. How much time to take off work? Anywhere between two to four weeks, um, you know, depending. I've had patients take, you know, just a week off. Um, just kind of depends. Military guys, police officers, EMTs, uh, things like that. Patients that don't know what they're getting into activity-wise every day when they go to work, I recommend you take the full four weeks so you can follow the activity restrictions. Um, otherwise, um, I think two weeks is perfectly reasonable, um, you know, for return to work. And if you, especially if you do, um, you know, desk work or um, you can work remotely from home, if you do IT stuff, um, you know, things like that, then, you know, sometimes less um, is fine as well if you don't have the ability um, to take more time off work to recover. As long as you're following the activity restrictions, you're good. Um, major, uh, let's see, does long-term chest binding affect the final cosmetic results? Um, yes and no. Um, long-term binding um, can really um, make the, uh, the chest um, hang down more and um, be less robust. Um, when it does that, it doesn't really affect um, the surgery except um, for the fact that um, the more pendulous um, the breasts are, which the breasts can become more pendulous with you know chronic binding, um, then sometimes um, it gives you a little bit more of a straight in straighter incision. Um, just because of the way the anatomy is at that point um, in order to accomplish the goals of the surgery um, and still you know leave enough tissue to where your um, incision or your scar isn't under tension um, um, then sometimes it can create a little bit more of a straight um, scar aesthetic but other than that um, no it really doesn't it really doesn't affect um, affect much and most of our patients are chronic you know binders that's very common um, well, I need to continue breast cancer screening after top surgery. Um, this is not a cancer operation. We are not removing all the breast tissue um, and, uh, you know, cats out of the bag. Even when we do mastectomies for cancer, we're not able to remove every single last cell um, of, of, you know, breast tissue. Um, and so, um, and this specifically, um, we're trying to, you know, create nice, full, um, robust flaps so that you have a good cosmetic result. So there's definitely, um, you know, it's, it's risk reducing um, since we're removing the majority of it, uh, but it's not, um, a, it's not a foolproof thing. So yes, um, once you have had top surgery, um, well, first of all, beforehand, if you have a strong family or personal history of breast cancer or biopsies or things like that, you need to talk with your surgeon um, about, you know, screening and stuff beforehand. Um, and, uh, and after the fact, um, it, you know, it's a lot more noticeable if you develop anything since the, all that tissue has been removed, you can usually kind of feel stuff. Um, um, but you should definitely still be, if you notice anything abnormal, um, you should, uh, you know, see your, um, see your uh, physician for a, a full workup that may include um, imaging, like ultrasound, biopsies, and things like that. Um, because again, this is not a cancer operation, and that's a very good question. Um, and then, we have one more? Two more. Two more. Okay. Two more, real quick, and then I think we're out of time. Okay. What is your preference? For areola and nipple graft together versus separate, how do you decide on placement? Oh, okay. So um, I think um, what you were asking um, is whether I do um, the areola graft separate from the nipple itself or as one whole piece. Um, at least I think that's um, what the question is. Um, that's actually a very good question. Um, so I base that, again, going back to um, the size and shape of the nipple itself. If you have a very large um, round nipple with a lot of projection, that kind of looks like a gumdrop or like a dot, <laughs> 
um, then that, if you think about it, a male nipple is about the size of a, a five cent piece or a nickel. Not nipple, but nickel. Um, and so if you take that as one piece, you have to thin a graft in order to make it take and your, have your body grow blood vessels into it. So if you thin that, then that whole you know, area of the nipple that's sticking up is then gonna flatten, right? And so then you're gonna end up with not a really significant nipple at all, and there's not gonna be a lot of projection, and then the whole complex is gonna be bigger than what you wanted. Um, so in those cases, I do them separate. Um, I take a piece of the areola, and that is, you know, thinned, shaped, sized, and you know, appropriately. And then I take a smaller, just piece of the nipple, and then I bring those two things together in order to create my graft to give you a good masculine nipple and areola. Um, if that's not the case, and your nipples are, are not gonna inhibit that from happening, then um, we just do it all in one piece. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And then, what if you have inverted nipples? Can I keep my small nipples and just have um, a small areola? Um, for, okay, so what if you have inverted nipples? Um, again, um, for inverted nipples, um, I would have to see it in, in person or see it in, in a photo. Um, it would depend on um, how much normal um, tissue is around it and how far the inversion is. Um, but typically, um, if I feel like the, um, the inverted nipples are not gonna give me a good result doing it the traditional way, then I would still employ the same techniques by using two separate pieces, right? A piece of the areola and a piece of nipple. Um, so that way we can kind of get rid of the, um, get rid of the inversion so that you can still have projection and have a right size, uh, uh, you know, a good size and shape um, for a masculine chest. Can I keep my small nipples and just have a small areola. So that is gonna depend on what type of surgery you're a candidate for. If you're doing a double incision top surgery, the short answer is no, um, because the nipple and the areola both are right within all that excess skin and soft tissue that has to come out. Um, and so because of that, that has to come off the body and get put back on in a new spot. And so in that case, um, it would be all done in, um, by removing the entire piece, I think, if that makes sense. And if not, you can, um, you can message me and, um, you know, or schedule a consultation and we can talk further um, if that didn't fully answer your question. Okay, um, so I think we are out of time, I'm sorry, but thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any um, additional questions or if you wanna get into some more detail about some of these questions, um, then uh, feel free to either leave your questions and, and message them there and we will um, respond to them um, you know, via uh, messaging. Um, otherwise, um, you can also always feel free to um, you know, call and schedule a consultation um, if you wanna um, chat over the phone. Um, that way we can get most of your questions answered. Okay, thank you.